cause her to pray at night for her children. A mother's love will cause her to go to hellish limits and back to see about her child. A mother's love will cause her to pace the floors in the midnight hour, concerned and worried about her child. A mother's love will cause her to go without so that her children can have. A mother's love is so great that she will spend her life caring for her children at her own expense. A mother's love is so valuable that she will spend time, effort, money, anything of value to make sure that her children have sufficient things to make them a, a qualified citizen to grow up. A mother's love is so valuable that she will, she will do anything for her child. If her child is in trouble, don't get in the way of a mother's love. If a child needs something and, and the mother thinks that her child is in danger, she will protect her children at all costs. A mother's love is so great that it extends beyond time, treasures, the grave, and even death. A mother's love is so valuable. We know that a mother, that the love of a mother is more valuable than anything on this side of the earth. But what about the love that we have for our mothers? Mm. Let's flip the script. Let's flip it. Do we love our mothers the way we should? Do we care for our mothers the way a mother should be cared for? Do we value our mothers? Will we go to the ends of the earth to provide for our mothers? Will we take care of our mothers? Do we show our mothers we love them? Do we take time out of our busy schedules to just tell our mothers, Mom, I love you. Do we go out of our way to show our mothers our care? Do we have disdain for our mothers? Do we talk to our mothers with indifference? Do we respect our mothers? God wants us to know that we need to respect our mothers and love them because they gave us life. Now I know all of us, for, for, for on Mother's Day, I know all of us may not be in a happy place because all of our mothers didn't care for us and they didn't encourage us. Some of us may have some mothers in the house today that maybe didn't treat you right. Maybe they didn't speak kind words to you. Maybe they didn't pour into your spirit. Maybe they didn't encourage you like they should have. But they did the best they could with what they had. We need to take this day especially. I don't care what type of situation you are in with your mother. If your mother is still alive, no matter what she's done to you, today's a great day to break the chain. Ask to do what God would do and forgive. Call your mother today, no matter what your state of relationship is in with your mother. Call your mother today if she's still alive and tell her that you love her. Tell her you love her. I was watching a video clip uh, yesterday looking for some things to show. And uh, I saw this one video clip, and I didn't present it because it was from an Indian family, and we African Americans now. So I didn't show a clip, but it, it was very, uh, it was very uh, powerful. There was this guy sitting on, the, on a, a bus bench waiting for the bench to come, waiting for the bus to come. And he had some flowers sitting next to him. It was Mother's Day. And this other guy comes up to him and begins to talk to him. He sits down with him and he begins to say, yeah, you know, my name is so and so. Who are you? Where are you waiting for the bus? Did the bus come yet? No, it didn't come. Then he looks down and sees the flowers. And he says, who are these flowers for? They're for my mother, he said, the other guy said. So the first guy said, well, yeah, I would have got my mom some flowers, but I just didn't have time. I'm busy with work, and I got too much to do. And he said, uh, the other guy said, uh, uh, well, these flowers are for my mom. She passed away a few years ago, and I was unable to give her these flowers. So every Mother's Day, I go and buy flowers, and I, I take them to her gravesite. And the, the other man began to just be depressed, and he began to think about what the first guy had said, and as he was getting ready to leave, uh, the, the first guy gave him the flowers and said, take these to your mother and give them on behalf of me and yourself. So I encourage all of us today, no matter what state we are in with our mothers, call them on this day and let them know you love them. Amen. Amen. As we look at our text today, we're going to be talking about a different kind of mother. And we won't hold you long, so we're almost finished. Uh, our thematic statement is this. When love is our primary motivation 
for treating others with kindness, God will grant us favor with him and with mankind. When love is our primary motivation, many of us, that's what's your motivation. No matter what we do, it should be done from a perspective of love. When our primary motivation for treating others with kindness, uh, when our primary, when love is our primary motivation for treating others with kindness, God will grant us favor with him and with mankind. So let's look, look at our text again. God grants favor to mothers, to those who love their mothers. From Ruth, the second chapter, verse 10 through 11. It says, at this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found favor, such favor with you in your eyes, that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and your mother and your homeland and came to live with the people you did not know before. So to put this in context and do this, this text justice, we want to make sure we look at the verses that precede it. And then we'll soon be out of your way. We hope that something is said here that will uh, touch your mind and it will grab your heart. Now this word is for mothers, but if you listen carefully, the word will apply to you. So get in where you fit in. Amen. Verse 1. It says, now, now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. So before we get here, we need to paint a little history. We'll do it real quickly. There was this woman by the name of Naomi. She and her husband Elimelech went to a faraway country, went to Moab, and she took her sons, or her, her sons with her. And so it was Elimelech, Naomi, and her two sons. They went to Moab. When they got to Moab, time elapsed, and the husband died. Naomi's husband died. Her two sons married two other women. And then both her sons died as well. So now it's just Naomi and these two other women, Ruth and Orpah. So to make a long story short, Naomi was getting ready to come back home, come back to Jerusalem, come back to where she was, come back to her hometown. And she didn't want her daughters-in-law to have to persevere the struggle that she was going to have to go through, trying to find a place of shelter, trying to find food to eat, trying to find all these things. So she told her daughters-in-law, listen, I, I love y'all and I know you love me, but y'all go your own way. Go back to your land and let me go my way. And to make a long story short, one of them went, the other one stayed. Ruth stayed with Naomi while Orpah went back. And Ruth's statement was so powerful. It says, basically, that where you live, I will live. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. If death, if nothing other than death separates us, may God do to me so severely. She was serious. Ruth was serious. So that paints the picture where we are. So now, uh, Naomi and Ruth have come back, and in verse one of the second chapter, we find here that Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And what God is saying here is that Naomi, who, she already had a relative. She had a relative. And she may not have known it, but she had a relative. And so God is telling us, that when we get ready to receive our blessing, there are some things that we already have. We don't have to look outside of ourselves for our blessing because many times the blessing you seek is the blessing you already have. God has put something within you or he's given you something that's already in your house. Somebody say it's in the house. So before you begin to look for your blessing outside, look at the blessing you already are. Receive the blessing you already are. Know that God has already instilled something in you. Just look around. He was a man of stand, of standing, a clan from the clan of Elimelech. So he had some money. He had some money. Verse 2. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose field I hope, and anyone whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, Go. Go ahead, my daughter. So this verse to me said two things. First of all, that Ruth was not afraid to do some work. We need to not be afraid to do work. God wants us to know that if we don't work, neither should we eat. But we need to be able to do some work. 
And what I really love about this verse is it says, let me go. The, there's an imperative. We've been talking about this in our Bible study class. The word go is an imperative, meaning that when we go, God's blessings will overtake us. And we talked about it at the Sunday school this morning in Bible study. Uh, we talked about the ten lepers. I, I believe the miracle is in the going. God will give us a command, but many of us are stationary. We, don't, we ain't going to move. We're going to be like a tree that's planted by the rivers of water in a, in a bad way. We ain't moving, and you can't make me move. I'm going to stay right here. God says go. He says go. And when we go, we find God's favor. We find God's blessing. We find God's miracles when we go. So we need to be obedient and go. Verse 3. So she went out into the field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Now this verse, if you read it the way I read it the first time, it, it's kind of ironic, uh, ironic that word, as it turns out, as, as, as if it was not planned. But when we begin to go, God gives us his divine stamp of approval. As it turned out, there's no happenstance, no coincidence. As it turned out, God planned it. He planned it this way. And he planned that when she went, she would be in company, or she would be set up for her blessing. God wants us to know that when we go, when we follow his commands, when we're obedient to his word, he's already planning things to, push, to position us where he wants us to be. Also in this verse, it says, so she went. The very first phrase, so she went. I really get, uh, get excited about that because in verse 2, it says, can I go? I'm going to go. It's one thing to say you're going to go. And it's another thing to, to, to actually go. So she went. If it's one thing to say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But we need to put some action to what God tells us to do. Put some feet to what God tells us to do. Don't just say you're going to do it, but do it. I believe I hear James saying, it's better to be a doer of the word than a hearer only. Amen? Verse 4. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. So this verse kind of shows us that he's a man of God. Because you wouldn't answer somebody with, the Lord be with you and the Lord bless you. And they answer back. So it says, just then, just then, Boaz arrived. If you didn't know before, I've come to tell you that God is a master orchestrator. We were talking about this in um, a choir person, and Sister Gina gave a beautiful testimony about her house. She just told it to you this morning about how she was going to become a homeowner. But the night before she was going to become a homeowner, her water heater went out. Had it been one more day, she would have been responsible for that heater. Thousands of dollars. But God is a master orchestrator. He orchestrates things for his people. He turns the tables around to bless his people. When we are in line with God, he will bless us. When, when, I, when we take care of his business, he'll take care of our business. Verse 5. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? Now we have to make this verse very plain. Boaz, when he came back and he asked the harvesters, he looked around and he saw, he saw Ruth, he said, ooh, 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 Lord Jesus, ooh, whoa, she's fine. Who is, who is that? Who she belong to? Fellas, now, you know, fellas, now, come on, help me out. Y'all know how we used to be, when we used to, used to be out in, the, you know, um, when we used to, you know, chase, y'all used to chase, when y'all used to chase and y'all saw a woman who, who met your Christ, you, you, yeah, y'all saw someone who, who just, you had to take a double look. You had to take a second look. Can anybody say brick house? 36, 24, 30, yes, yes. She was fine. So, so Boaz noticed her. He looked at her and said, mm, who is that? Who does that young woman belong to? Verse 6. The overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. People know more about you than you think. People are watching you. They're watching you. And what you do can either lead somebody to Christ or lead them away from Christ. 
We'll leave it right there. Verse 7, she said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and as uh, remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So she wasn't afraid to work. She wasn't afraid to pull up her sleeves and, and get some work, do some work. Uh, so somebody was watching her, the harvesters were watching her, and Boaz is getting this report from her. Verse 8, so Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me, don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Boaz recognized what he had, and he didn't want to lose her. So he said, I need you to stay here. And that term, my daughter, that doesn't mean it was actually his daughter. This is the term of endearment. He's saying, please stay here. Don't go and glean in another field or don't go pick crops from another field. I want you to stay in my field. When you have a blessing, you need to recognize the blessing you have. I'll say it again. When you have a blessing, you need to recognize the blessing you have. Don't wait until your blessing is gone before you realize what you had. Amen. Verse 9. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. Now in this verse, we see that when we are positioned where God wants to be, he will give us protection and provision. When we are where God wants us to be, he will give us protection and provision. See, the way God operates is he sends his word out ahead of us. He says he knows what he's going to do from the beginning. God knows the end from the beginning. So what he does is he sends out his blessings to a particular place, to a particular time, to a particular season. And if we are not in line with where those blessings are, then we're going to miss our blessing. But if we follow God's positioning, wherever he leads us, to the left, to the right, navigating through mountains, over valleys, through hills, when we get to where we're supposed to be, God's provision is there. So if you don't follow God's commands, don't expect your blessing. Also, in this verse 9, we see Jesus. Anybody see Jesus in verse 9? Let me make him plain to you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. We know that Jesus is, if we drink of him, we shall never thirst again. So this points to Jesus, and we'll see him further, we'll see Jesus in this story as we go. It says, whenever we drink of Jesus, the word of God says that if we thirst, we're to come to him. And if we drink of the water that he gives us, we shall never thirst again. Verse 10. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? She began to be humble. She's humbled herself. She bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, Boaz, what, why have I found so much favor with you? Why have you noticed me? And I'm a foreigner. Now, foreigners were outcasts. They were downtrodden. They were looked, they were looked, they weren't even looked on. And what we, we've been talking about the last few, uh, last Sunday and this morning in Bible study, is that a foreigner is a person that can still find God's favor. A foreigner can find God's favor. See, what other people look over, God looks at. And if you feel as though you are foreign, you are in foreign soil, and you are a foreigner, then you are in the right place to be used by God. Because God uses foreigners in the glory. Verse 11, Boaz replied, I've been told about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother in, in the homeland and came to live with the people you did not know. So in the previous verse, it says, uh, uh, Ruth is asking, why have you found favor? In verse 11, it says, because of what you did for your mother-in-law. So we want to put a little pin right here. Are we loving our mothers, our mothers-in-law, like we should? God grants favor to those who love their mothers. Now, we don't just want to love them because we want something of God. Amen. But we want to love them out of a pure heart and with pure motives. God loves, God grants favor to those who love their mothers. When Boaz had heard of everything that she had done for her mother-in-law, he knew that fruit doesn't fall too far from the tree. 
even though Naomi was not uh, Ruth's biological mother, but she was her spiritual mother. And fruit doesn't fall too far from the tree. So when we were talking about how Boaz was so excited about Ruth, I want to get your minds out of the gutter because Boaz saw something in her that transcended her physical appearance. He saw her spirit. He saw her spirit. And I want to put a pin right there for those of us, for the young folk, you know, and for the old folk too, for those of us who are still courting and dating and trying to find someone. Uh, Boaz and Ruth, are there. it's a great story. Boaz was looking for a woman who was full of the spirit. And, and, and Ruth was looking for a man who loved God. That's what I want to that tonight. For those who are seeking relationships and those who are seeking to get close to someone, men, well, let me start with the women. The women said, the, the, for four women, the word says, a man that findeth a woman findeth a good thing. So for women, you don't need to search for a man because God's going to draw the right one. He's going to let the eyes of the man who you're supposed to have be opened. God will do the drawing. Now, for the men, we, we don't want just uh, someone who's uh, got a beautiful shape on the outside because that is fleeting. I'm talking to the men and the young men in the house today. You, you want a woman who loves God. You want a woman who's going to care for you and take care of you and be able to, 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 uh, to give you a good life and a good home. Make sure you don't get a woman who is just a gold digger. Amen. Amen. But you want someone who loves God. Women, when God sends you the right man, open your eyes. Many of us, many of the women don't want a, 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 a brother who who's in the word, who are a brother who's, who's going to study. But the, so most women, and that, that's just generalization, most women like roughnecks, and men who are in trouble, men who don't, don't have no job, men who don't care about nothing, that's what women dra uh, gravitate to. But God is saying, break the mold. Look for someone who loves God. Look for someone who takes care of his mother. Because if he takes care of his mother, he's going to take care of you. Look for a man who, who's going to treat you right. Someone who's going to love you. Amen. Moving right along. Moving right along. Verse 12 says, May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord for the God of Israel, the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to, ref to re take refuge. So Boaz is pronouncing a blessing on her because of what she did for her mother-in-law. Verse 13, may I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do, have, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. Again, she's being so humble. She's a humble woman. Verse 14, at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. Now in verse 13, she's humble. In verse 14, Boaz exalts her. Just want to let you know that if we want to be humble, then we need to, if, if, if we don't want, uh, if we want to be exalted, be humble. The prerequisite for being exalted is humility. If you're humble, God will exalt you. If you're exalted, there's no place for you to go but down. Amen. Verse 15. And so she got up to glean. Boaz gave orders to his men. Let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Kind of self-explanatory. Verse 16. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up. And don't rebuke her. Now I like this verse because it says that when God got ready to bless her, there was something she had to do. The blessing was there. He told his men, when you go pull the corn, when you go pull the grain, I want you to take out some of the best pieces that you pull and just leave them on the ground. Just leave them there for her to pick up because he wanted to be a blessing to her. God wants to be a blessing to us. God has left some stuff, but we need to pick it up. How many blessings have we bypassed because we're too spiritually lazy to pick it up? God wants us to pick up the blessings. Now, not every blessing is like that. Sometimes God will bless you and there's nothing you have to do for it. But there are some blessings that God will bless you with where he wants you to partner with him. He wants you to have a, 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 some say, some. 
some, 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 some attitude, some equity in the transaction as well. So he will leave it for you to pick up. And many of us don't receive all the blessings that God has for us because we don't want to pick it up. We're too lazy, too lethargic to pick up what God has for us. Amen. Pick up your blessing. Verse 18. Uh, let's get the verse. Verse 17. So Ruth gleaned in the field until morning, until evening. Then she threshed the, bar, uh, the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an epa. I looked that word epa up, and it was like 22 to 35 liters. It was a dry measurement. Still know what that is. Amen. Verse 18. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. So remember, uh, Ruth is taking care of her mother-in-law. So she, all this food that she got, she took it back to her mother because she loves her mother. Verse 19, her mother-in-law asked, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Now wait a minute. She wasn't out there. How did she know some man was looking after her? Amen. Let's read for it. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked for today is Boaz, she said. So no doubt, Ruth, uh, Naomi, I'm sorry, had some common sense. She know, there's no way in the world you're going to bring all this stuff up in this house and wasn't no man involved. Because back then, back then, you got to think about the culture they were in. Women were treated like second-hand, second-class, if that. Amen. They didn't have anything, and if anything was given to them, a man had to be involved. So Ruth, I mean, Naomi understood this. She said, there's no way you could bring all this stuff in the house without so a man being involved. Who was he? Verse 20, so she tells him in verse 19, he was Boaz. In verse 20, the Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is our guardian redeemer. Guardian Redeemer. When we think about Boaz being a guardian redeemer, back in that time, because uh, Naomi had lost both her, her husband and her sons, she could not claim her property. So someone in the family, a man in her family had to do it. And this man had to be kin. So the King James says he was a kinsman. That someone near the family had to be kin to come take control of the property that was due to somebody else. This is where Jesus comes in. God sent Jesus and he was our redeemer. He's our redeemer. But Jesus couldn't redeem us without being kin to us. So he was born to a virgin Mary. He was wrapped in swaddling clothes so he could feel everything that we felt. He walked the dusty streets of Jerusalem and did everything that we would do. Yet he remained sinless. But he did it so that he could be kin to us. So that he could redeem us. Somebody should have got excited right then because Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. He came to redeem us and to set us free. Verse 21. Then Ruth said, then Ruth, the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all the, all the grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the woman uh, who worked for him because in some else, someone else's field you might be harmed. So we see that when we're positioned where God wants us to be, there's protection. Verse 23. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until barley, to glean until the barley and wheat harvest were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. So this story just tells us that God grants favor to those who love their mothers. God grants favor to those who love their mothers. And as we look at our, our thematic statement again, the thematic statement says that when love is our primary motivation for treating others with kindness, God will grant us favor with him and with mankind. God grants favor to those who love their mothers. And then I pray this word would have touched you. I pray this word gave you something today that maybe you didn't know before. And if nothing else, we pray that this word would cause you to, uh, to act. We want you to be action-oriented today. If you have a mother that you're estranged with, we pray that you would call your mother today. If your mother is still alive, tell your mother you love her. Wish her happy Mother's Day. God bless you. We're going to do something a little out of the ordinary here in our MTP class. I'm 
we've been talking about discipleship and we've been uh, investing a lot of time in the study. So I, I told our leadership team to be prepared to offer the invitation. And so I know they're prepared because they are always prepared. And I'm going to ask Sister Shalanda to come and grant to us the invitation. And uh, if she's gonna give her a little space and time to, to, to formulate those thoughts, we pray that you would hear what she has to say and pray for her.